It's a particular uh, pleasure to, uh, to, to be here today to uh, welcome Dean Kite from Tufts. Um, she's got a history with UMass Boston and the McCormick Graduate School. I, I think her first presence here, and hold on, let me see if I can share this screen here. Her first uh, sojourn here, I believe, on the invitation of uh, Professor Maria Ivanova was five years ago. Uh, pretty much, uh, you know, almost exactly five years ago. Um, and I know she's going to talk a little bit about Paris today, but this was, if you look at the date, this was a month before um, the Paris meeting started. And we had a small series uh, called Climate at a Crossroads and how can Paris kickstart a zero carbon resilient economy. And man, so much has happened. <laughs> so much has happened in these last five years. Uh, some that we could predict and some that we couldn't predict. And uh, I'm really excited to hear your talk today, Dean Kite, because you were at the ground floor of so many of the important sustainability efforts that the United Nations was pushing and, um, and at Paris. And uh, now, uh, like I have, and many who are on the Zoom call have, have gone from public service to a different kind of public service in academia. and. Uh, and uh, trying to understand how research and teaching can uh, push the agendas that we think are so important in this world. So it's particularly enjoyable that you're uh, here today. I'm not gonna give your full introduction. Uh, that will be to our next speaker, who is uh, Professor Maria Ivanova from the department, newly the uh, graduate program director of the Global Governance and Human Security PhD program. So it's very exciting to have her in that new role. And I'm not sure he's here, but Stacy Vanderveer, who's the new department chair as well. Uh, and thank you to the outgoing chair, Darren Q. Uh, it's just been a great, the department is just a fantastic team and with Kelly Lee and Charlotte here as well, uh, just a phenomenal group that uh, 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 tends to the students and makes sure the research happens and makes sure engagement happens. So it's fantastic to be part of this event. Thank you, Evan, for the invitation and let me pass it over to Maria. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dean Cash, and uh, welcome, Rachel. It is truly my honor to welcome Rachel Kite back to the UMass Boston community. As uh, our Dean just mentioned, she spoke on our campus, our physical campus, <laughs> in November of 2015, just a month before the climate conference, when she was the vice president and special envoy for climate change at the World Bank. And indeed, a lot has happened since then in the world stage, but also in Rachel Kite's life. She today joins us as the Dean of the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University. It is the oldest graduate school of international affairs. Rachel is the 14th Dean of Fletcher, but also the first woman in that position. Prior to taking the role of Dean at the Fletcher School, Rachel Kite served as the special representative of the UN Secretary General and as CEO of Sustainable Energy for All. That was an initiative of UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon that was launched to achieve universal energy access, expand renewable energy and attain energy efficiency. Previously, she served as the Vice President and Special Envoy for Climate Change at the World Bank Group, where she developed strategies to make hundreds of billions dollars of dollars available to developing countries eager to address climate change, but lacking the resources. Rachel Kite has played a very important role in leading the push by the current UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, for countries and companies to make new commitments to expedite the energy transition away from fossil fuels. Her, some of her accomplishments include bringing forward the recognition of natural capital, helping build the accounting principles around it, and working to create a global movement to put a price on carbon. Rachel has often been the only room, the only woman at the negotiating table the only woman in the room, and has championed women's leadership in sustainable development. In 2019, Time Magazine featured Rachel Kite as one of the 15 women in the world 
leading the fight against climate change. So I had, to, I had the privilege to interview Rachel in 2015 for the series of global leadership dialogues right after the Paris Agreement that we publish at the Center for Governance and Sustainability. I asked her then what we could learn from her experience regarding women's leadership and mentorship. I think that you have to make space for women coming behind, she said. You have to put your foot in the door and then kick the door a little bit further open and let other women come in behind you because somebody put her foot in the door for you. The sense of solidarity is very important, said Rachel. So indeed, Rachel Kite has opened a lot of doors for a lot of women and a lot of men working on climate and sustainability. She has now formally become an educator and we're delighted that she is in the Boston ecosystem of higher education. And so today we gather to talk about the challenge of preparing global leaders as we educate for uncertainty. At this time of crisis, the leadership challenges loom large and the responsibility to be better educators is more prescient than ever. I am delighted to welcome Dean Rachel Kite back to our UMass Boston community. Rachel, over to you. Well, well, thank you very much, Professor Ivanova, for that very generous uh, introduction. And thank you to Dean Cash, uh, to Professor Weitzman, and everybody in the UMass family for this uh, great opportunity. And I, I am really, truly sorry that we're not all uh, together. And what an honor to be in the presence of, of Ben Slomov. We, we have met uh, at Fletcher. Ben is a, an extremely generous supporter of uh, Fletcher's work on nonviolent conflict. Um, and without his uh, uh, opening the door for others, there are many Fletcher students who wouldn't have had the chance to travel around the world and to really understand uh, nonviolent struggle and nonviolent conflict uh, in the way that they have. So uh, it's, it's, a real, it's a real honor to be here uh, in, in many, many different ways. And when Maria interviewed me for that leadership series, it was very, very late at night in the fifth arrondissement, if I remember carefully. So, uh, you know, I may have had a couple of drinks beforehand, but I think that uh, the point that I'm making uh, stands true. Uh, and what a moment, uh, what a moment in our history to think about um, educating for uncertainty, to think about how we bring forward um, individuals, but then individuals who will build institutions that, that we need for a world which is hurtling forward at an incredible pace um, and which um, has certain things that we know to be true. There are things about which we can be certain for which we need to train, but much that we are uncertain of uh, and which, which really means that we have to challenge the nature of the education um, that, we, uh, that we embark upon, the education that we invest in. So what I'd like to do today is, is just talk about certainty and uncertainty, talk about the moment that we find ourselves in and how much that is potentially uh, quite seismic in nature is going on at the moment, talk about what that means for the plan, uh, the, the pathway forward, and therefore what it means for our understanding of uncertainty and certainty, and to talk then about the challenge in education. So the training for uncertainty and education, educating for uncertainty, really, uh, I owe the uh, inspiration for that to Professor Helga Nowotny, who was, uh, in the last decade, the chair of the European Research Advisory Board uh, of the European Commission. She's a famous uh, uh, social scientist herself um, and has spent a lifetime uh, looking at the social study of, of science. And I think what's very important about this moment in our history, um, and even if you look back over Ben Slomo's incredible life, that the way in which uh, the social sciences, humanities and hard sciences are needed, and the way in which we need to um, bring them together in order to find the solutions to uh, the uh, problem set that we face. I think this is demanding more of young people today than perhaps was demanded of us. I mean, it's difficult to think of a discipline, it's dif difficult to think of a challenge we face as humanity that isn't going to require a complex 
fusing together of hard science, social science and humanities. Perhaps that has always been the case, but it feels that uh, at the pace with which things are changing, that is particularly important now. So Helga and Watney really challenged me to think about uh, the uh, educating for uncertainty piece of this um, uh, piece of this puzzle. And this was a conversation I had with her at the beginning of the year. Um, so before COVID, just, just weeks before COVID. And of course, I think this pandemic has thrown into deep relief the challenges uh, that we already had. So where are we in the world at the moment? Well, this week is the annual meetings of the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank, as many of you will know. The IMF is updating its world economic outlook. It is bleak reading. The World Bank is going to update its poverty analysis and reveal that between 150, maybe between 150 and 200 million people are going to be pushed back into poverty as a result of COVID. That's wiping out 20 years of progress. Almost 100 countries have gone to the IMF for help. And about 180 countries, though I think that's going to be updated to about 190, countries are stagnant or shrinking in growth at the moment. So this makes this uh, perhaps the second or third biggest economic setback since we started recording. But in fact, because it is a crisis of both public finances and private finances of the household and at the community and at the national level, and is a global crisis, it is probably the most severe economic crisis we have faced in modern history. And with the pandemic still rolling along, there isn't really yet a pathway out of these woods. Today, again, in the same week, the World Energy Outlook has just been published by the International Energy Agency. What's so important about that, you would say? Well, for the first time, the most influential report that it sits on the desk of every energy minister and many finance ministers is going and which studies the supply side of energy, the demand side of energy, the innovation and the new energy sources that we can expect to benefit from or suffer from includes for the first time an analysis of what the world needs to do to actually arrive at the point that it decided to arrive at. This is one and a half degrees of warming above pre-industrial levels. So this report for the first time actually is uh, coherent with political decision making. Remarkable to think that you can make political decisions and then the data set that you use isn't actually uh, based upon those political decisions. But that is temporarily resolved today. And what does it say? Well, it says that we can get to net zero emissions and I'll talk about a little bit more about that later. I'll unpack what that really means. It says that we can do it by 2050, but it imagines a completely different energy system than the one we have today. Why is that important? Because the hard handbrake turn for those of you who can drive a manual car that we are going to have to go through in the next 10 years to get on track for a world that will be more sustainable and therefore more peaceful is something that we have never attempted, let alone begun to execute in our history. The good news is that evidence is that it can be done. Bad news is that we have no time to waste. And that's just this week. If we think about the past month, we've seen incredible um, uh, news cycles. We've seen that the Arctic ice shelf has reached or shrunk to its smallest ever and its thinnest in depth in recorded history. We've seen that now nearly $12 trillion of assets under management, your pension and mine, well not mine, have been divested from fossil fuels just in the last six years. We've seen that Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia, the king of oil, has signed an export agreement to Japan to produce and ship green hydrogen. That's hydrogen made exclusively from renewable energy and transported in the form of green ammonia. If you'd asked anybody two years ago if they expected to see that press release, they, wouldn't have, they, would, not have, uh, they would not be able to say that they did. And at the General Assembly, marking the 75th anniversary of the United Nations, President Xi Jinping stood up and committed China to a net zero economy by 2060. That means peaking emissions 
on or before 2030. He spoke after the US president raced through his 14 minutes of, of allocated time, and he spoke for just seven minutes, leaving observers to wonder whether in fact for the United States, this was a discourse on global solidarity, or in fact, free footage for a campaign commercial. In the last month, reports have come out also, one after the other, on species loss and extinction, on biodiversity loss and uh, uh, conversion of natural habitat, and on the relationships between nature and zoonotic pandemics like the one in which we're living through. The Nobel Peace Prize was given to the World Food Programme in large part because of the extraordinary effort that they are mustering and the dire warnings that they are giving that between 250 million and 280 million people are now food insecure as a result of COVID and that this will likely lead to famine. And while we give them the award with one hand, on the other, their warnings are going largely ignored. We at the Fletcher School feel this most profoundly because the work at the World Peace Foundation housed at Fletcher and that of many of our other um, uh, academics has looked in detail at how famine and starvation must not be used as a tool of war, which led to the Security Council resolution in 2018 uh, forbidding this. As we work to put in place mechanisms to make that resolution a reality, we see COVID-19 and the fragility and the brittleness of food supply chains challenge the sustain sustainability of countries, challenge their ability to be resilient and their ability to come back from a shock, but actually undermine uh, the peace and development that those countries will need in order to become more resilient and to recover. So COVID has pulled the carpet, as it were, under, from underneath us as we stood in a rather unstable, teetering state. We stood at the beginning of this year, at the beginning of a decade of necessary progress towards sustainable development goals, a decade of ac accelerated progress towards our goals of decarbonisation. And then COVID came. And so it is undoubtedly a time where things seem to be moving fast and the dislocation uh, does not help us concentrate on what is important. So it's certain that we need to train for a world that needs to work better for more people. And it's true that we need to educate for the uncertainty of how we will prepare ourselves for shocks, which we have never seen before, some of which are existential. So I have two quotes for you at this point before I start talking about the pathway forward from this incredible moment of, which is both exciting and terrifying at the same time. The first is from Doug Hammarskjöld, which seems appropriate in the 75th year of the United Nations. He said that you should never measure the highest point of a mountain until you reach the top, because then you will see how low that mountain really was. And I think this is important because we are now talking about an extraordinary moment of recovery from a nadir that many people could not have imagined. And one instinct is to say, oh, well, it can't be done. And so the short-term instinct is to do more of what is familiar. But the educating for uncertainty means that we have to make decisions now, not knowing how they will result, but based on the best data that we have, the best information that we have, and hoping that when we get to the top of that mountain that seems so tall now, we'll realize it wasn't an impossible climb. The second quote is from Dennis Healy, who was a proud socialist and the Minister of Finance for Labour governments when I was growing up in Britain. He was a plain spoken and very sharp and acidic uh, uh, orator. And he said, there is a Healy's rule of holes. And Healy's first rule of holes is when you're in one, you should stop digging. This applies to the fact that at this particular moment in time, we have an opportunity, and I would say an obligation, to pivot. Because the way that we were organized in the world, 
and the way that our leaders were leading the world before COVID hit was not on the right course. It was not sustainable. And so perhaps we need to stop doing some of the things that were putting us in such a vulnerable position as we try to build back better. So before COVID hit, it's important to remember that we were talking about this fourth industrial revolution made possible by extraordinary advances in digital technologies, in um, AI and machine learning, and the ability to have an internet of things, and that in digitalization, we could open up opportunities to those who had always been disenfranchised and who had found, found it difficult to participate economically and socially before. There seemed to be no uh, end to the possibilities. But, and we were talking therefore, sorry, about the intelligence to engage with artificial intelligence, the intelligence that we would need as humans to engage and use machine learning and robotics uh, to make this modern world a fairer one and a more sustainable one. This is still, I think, an absolutely essential component of how we think about the future. But at the same time, there were these growing drumbeats. There was the growing drumbeat of the need to decarbonize and a growing, growing drumbeat around inclusion or the lack of it. And what the corrosive effect of inequality was on growth and opportunity for, for people all around the world. Inequality was reducing between countries, but rising rapidly within countries. Each year in January, just before COVID became a worldwide phenomenon, Oxfam produces a report that looks at the number of billionaires whose wealth is equivalent to half or more of the world's population. And we've seen that in the six months of COVID, six of those billionaires have increased their wealth to the point where they uh, alone are, are equal to the value of more than, I think, a quarter of the world's population. We have never before seen this degree of inequality. And before COVID hit, the International Monetary Fund had started to raise a crescendo of concern about how this was impacting growth, how this was impacting development and distribution within economies. COVID has, of course, accelerated and exacerbated that problem. And so when we think about the pathway forward and we think about what's certain, what's uncertain, what's certain is that that was not building the resilience we needed for a pandemic and is not the resilience we need to future shocks. What is uncertain is will we have the wherewithal to put ourselves on a different course? And then the second issue was one of decarbonization. We know, so this is certain, that we are at the cause of uh, climate change. We know that in order to protect the planet and its essential functions, then uh, we need to arrive at warming no more than one and a half degrees above pre-industrial levels. We know that that means that we have to have an economy by 2050 at the latest that is one of net zero emissions, which means that everything that goes up into the atmosphere either has to be captured or stored or used. It means that we have to have net zero. Everything that goes up, we, can't, we have to uh, bring out of the atmosphere as well. This means that we have to uh, think about uh, reducing uh, the amount of emissions uh, in, in gross levels. It isn't just about being more efficient in how we uh, produce carbon emissions. It means that every company, every country needs to know how it's going to get to net zero. It means that some companies will win, some will lose, some will need to be managed out of existence by partnerships between the public and private sector. It means uh, that we will have to help developing countries get to net zero because they find themselves in remarkable 
uh, situations where they cannot provide for the basic needs of their populations already. It means that those countries that have put a lot of em emissions into the atmosphere over the last 100 years need to come down quicker than 2050. 2050 is the point at which we must all arrive. Some will have to go sooner. Others can then come up a little later. And so this is what was so important about the Chinese announcement at the General Assembly, because it comes together with a European Union agreement that uh, the European Union will reach net, reach net zero uh, by, 20, uh, uh, by, by 2050 with a 55% uh, reduction in emissions uh, by 2030. So these are extraordinary ambitious uh, statements of intent. Uh, but it's uh, also not something just for the mid-century, it is something for the next 10 years. In order to arrive at 2050 as net zero, we have to reduce half of the emissions in this decade. And so before COVID hit, we knew we were not in the right place and we were not on the right track. Of these things, we could be certain. Uncertain is how we can respond. And so what is the pathway forward? Well, the first, of the first thing I think to note is that the recovery effort is one effort. There is one effort now to recover from COVID and to do so in a cleaner, um, less polluting way, and to do so in a way which actually builds the resilience of everybody. And if COVID has taught us anything, it is that we cannot self-isolate from a pandemic and we cannot self-isolate from the impacts of climate change. And actually you cannot self-isolate, you cannot put a gated community around yourself in a world of deep inequality. And so we are only as resilient as our neighbour. And this seems to me uh, a tenet at the at, right at the heart of conflict resolution. This is a tenet right at the heart of, of, of peaceful uh, protest uh, and peaceful um, uh, uh, nonviolent conflict and, and at the heart of sustainability. And it has been brought to the fore by this pandemic. The Secretary General, who I still advise, is absolutely clear that this is one recovery and there's only one chance to build back better. It's a generational chance, it's a, it's, a, um, it's a one in a hundred years, it gets described in different ways, but it's here and it's right now. And so it shines a light on the kinds of leaders that we put out into the world. So what does that mean in concrete terms? It means that we cannot saddle the poorest countries and the poorest within our communities with more debt in order to get back to growth post-COVID. It means that we cannot use public money or um, incentivize private money to invest in fossil fuels and things which will not be uh, useful uh, you know, in, 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 in years to come. It means that we shouldn't be developing vaccines that won't be able to be delivered free and equally to everyone. It changes the question of what is the, what, what, what is the exam question we face? It isn't like, should we have a vaccine or shouldn't we? It's how do we produce a vaccine that can be available to everybody equally and affordably? You know, how do we um, build an energy system which allows everybody to have access to energy, allows us to do it without polluting the planet and allows us to build the efficiency uh, so that we are not drawing down natural resources as a result? In terms of food, for example, the question is not, can I have healthy food? The question is not, can I be food secure? It's, can we have a food system that produces a healthy, affordable, desirable diet for everyone? Um, and can we move forward to a world where that food system isn't killing the planet and isn't killing us? At the moment, we're either over or undernourished, most of us in the world, and the food system is undermining natural ecosystems. So the, this moment of crisis of COVID is, is like a, a parting of the clouds. There is a bright light of certainty that has come through that we will have to do something differently and that the price of inaction is actually higher than the price of action. We see the fires, we see the storms, we see the food supply lines, we see that a third of all Americans are food insecure at the moment. And we have to come back to these things that we know. We know that GDP is a very blunt instrument of progress from a natural capital point of view, but it's an extremely blunt uh, measurement of progress in terms of our investment in health and education and social welfare systems. So if we can't indebt the world in order to uh, get out of the COVID crisis, can we imagine that we can have a climate for debt swap? Can we write off 
debt and encourage countries to adopt better climate policies uh, in return? Should we actually just simply put forward um, repo schemes, repossessing the debt of African countries, wiping off the slate of, of a, uh, or wiping clean the slate and, and addressing the injustice of climate that was reaped upon the country, uh, on that continent, but not by them as part of moving Africa forward to a point where it can build its own resilience? Should we just move to uh, advanced market commitments at scales that we've never seen for the vaccines that everybody will need and the treatments that everybody will need, not only to recover from COVID-19, but to prepare for COVID-21 and 23 and 25? So these are very big leadership questions in an era of uncertainty. And when we look at who is leading well now, at the CEO level and at the country level, we have to look at those leaders that have embraced, um, uh, have embraced a, an authenticity which has been rare in recent years. They have embraced what we call reciprocal vulnerability, the ability to stand up in front of their workers, in front of their uh, citizens and say, we don't know everything, but we know a lot and together we will make decisions uh, and I trust you to work with me to make sure that we make the right decisions and that we course correct if we have to. This is a stark contrast to the bluster and the um, misinformation and at times the sheer uh, mangling of data that we see in, in our own country here in the United States and in my home country in the United Kingdom. Is it, interesting to me, it is interesting to me that this reciprocal vulnerability is often being displayed by young women leaders, by Jacinda Ardern, by Meta Fredrickson. These are small economies, but they are beacons of hope in terms of what it takes. But then how do we educate for that? So my last point really is about what we know about how our education system is or is not preparing us for this extraordinary world. The OECD's analysis is that we are either undereducating or overeducating within the OECD or the developed countries. And we're not doing a very good job of it. And we're certainly not doing a very good job of being ready for this world that is coming. So uh, we know that adults don't have the right skills for the new jobs in this uh, fourth industrial world, but a fourth industrial world which now needs to be investing heavily in social care and welfare and health and education and has to be investing in the clean energy technologies that we need for the pivot to decarbonization. We know that adult training should favor the disadvantaged in order to solve this problem of inclusion. We know that non-standard work is not a marginal phenomenon. Non-standard work, the gig economy, is going to be a very big part of how we work in the future. People will have multiple jobs, for example. And we know that if you are a non-standard worker, you are much less likely to have any form of social protection uh, uh, at the moment. And that social protection has to be adopted, adapted to the future of work. We know that non-standard workers are 40 to 50% less likely to have any form of income support. And we know that 50% uh, are, 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 are likely to be uh, ununionized. And, and I mention unions just in terms of the record of unions in terms of protection. We know that these people are frontline workers. We know that these people are, cannot be self-isolated from society if we are all to be resilient. We know that 30% of all jobs are going to be radically transformed by uh, technology and automation. We know that 40% of all jobs are actually at risk of disappearing from autom by automation. And we know that the OECD is aging and not everybody as gracefully as Ben Sloth. And so the questions we have then are as automation replaces jobs, but also creates new ones, as the gig economy becomes a big part of how people work. And as we are aging and as other continents are youthful in their growth, we have to concentrate on the increasing need for human intelligence to interface with science and technology and our ability to be able to bring natural and social sciences and humanities together. So we have 
huge challenges ahead of us at the local level, at the national level, and at the international level. Huge reasons for hope and excitement at the kinds of jobs that can be created. More jobs in healthcare and elder care and social care. More jobs in ecosystem restoration and nature-based solutions. More jobs in resilience, in composting, in food banks, uh, the food systems at the local level. More jobs in electric vehicle infrastructure. Uh, more jobs in, in the microgrids that make our energy systems more resilient, more jobs in offshore wind and the hydrogen and green um, ammonium industries that could operate off the coast of Massachusetts as well, more jobs, more jobs, more jobs in the refurbishment of buildings to be energy efficient. And so therefore, at the beginning of this decade, we had the sustainable development goals with 10 years to go. It's a good agenda. It was a crowdsourced agenda. It's a worldwide agenda. We had the challenges of climate and inclusion. COVID has dislocated us, but it hasn't broken us. And it is a parting of the clouds that lets us see more clearly the need to prepare for a decade of, um, uh, of uncertainty. And so therefore our leaders must be ones who know their heads and their hearts. We should be equipping every social scientist and those in the humanities with at least an understanding of how the hard science comes to play. That means that they must understand data science, they must understand the science of climate, at least so at some level. It means that um, we have the opportunity to teach leadership in a way that uh, perhaps we haven't fully up to now, looking at the vulnerability of leadership, not just at its strength. But most of all, we have an opportunity to prepare young people for a world that uh, uh, is moving faster than uh, anyone that we can remember in modern times, but which has extraordinary opportunity, but not if we don't take decisions now and if we uh, push decisions out into the future. I'd be happy to open up questions uh, and uh, discuss this in more detail. Thank you. Thank you. Please uh, join me with some Zoom applause here for Dean Kite. Thank you so much. Um, folks, given, given the size of the group, we thought we would take questions a couple of different kinds of ways. Um, feel free to raise your hand and unmute yourself and, and ask a question and or drop thoughts or questions in the chat. Both are good. Nancy. Well, how do you get people to buy electric vehicles, one, and the reading level of so many children today is about fourth grade level, and if they're going to have a job, it needs to be bumped up to about a 12th grade level. So how, how do we resolve those problems? So the electric vehicle um, question is a really great question. And I was asked this question by a congressman from California uh, two, three weeks ago when I testified to the Foreign Affairs Committee in the Senate, um, sorry, in the House. And, uh, and then about three days later, Gavin Newsom, the governor of California, announced that, um, that, that basically there would be no new um, internal combustion cars sold in California, I think, after... 20, uh, was it 2035? I, I, I may have got the date wrong. Um, what, this, what this means is that um, I, I think that the, uh, your, 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 choi your choice of electric vehicle is going to be uh, uh, a, an affordable choice and it's going to be the one in front of you. And um, I think government will increasingly um, incentivize that to happen uh, in in Europe now, most uh, car manufacturers uh, are phasing out internal combustion engines, i.e., building new ones by the middle of uh, this decade. Uh, I would imagine that if there is a change in um, administration in the United States after November the third, that that would pick up a pace again in this country. The the car manufacturers have been sort of playing both sides of the of the debate, uh, you know trying to see, trying to guess what, what, 
what's going on between the Trump administration and California in particular. So I, I think that this is this is happening, and the car manufacturers are making these decisions actually uh, absent regulation. Um, because it, it's it's going to be just too complicated to maintain a business building internal combustion engines and a business building electric vehicles. And I'll I'll, I'll tell you a, a very short anecdote. So I'm expecting some very big announcements by truck manufacturers in the next few weeks um, coming out of Europe. But this will this will actually have a knock on effect for the global truck manufacturing business. And I was talking to the CEO of one of the leading world's leading truck manuf manuf manufacturers. You know, he said to me, look, I, I'm going to have to invest an extraordinary amount of money. I won't give you the number on compliance with the seventh generation of NOx, um, so this is nitro nitrogen oxide uh, uh, emissions. Um, and these are emissions that come from an internal combustion engine. And he said, you know, Rather than spending my money on that, you know, I think the future of the internal combustion engine, we're just discussing when it's going to end. It's not whether or not it ends. And therefore, I don't want to spend any more money on complying. I want to just spend that money in investing in the performance of electric uh, and potentially hydrogen fuel cell trucks. And therefore, I am just going to bring forward the date with which we will pivot from one uh, energy system to another because the amount of R&D and the lead time for developing that engine is so long. And so I'm, I'm expecting that, you know, big trucks even are going to go electric uh, very soon. So I think that what's going to happen is that very quickly uh, the car manufacturers are going to come forward with the kinds of designs that you need. And governments should simply be making sure that those are affordable uh, to people on the low income side of things. Um, your second point about reading levels, I think it's really important. We, we simply don't invest enough in education um, in many countries. In many countries, the investment levels are high, but they're perverse in that they're very inefficiently um, spent. And so we spend extraordinary amounts of money um, uh, on elite education. Um, we spend extraordinary amounts of money on sort of remedial education, and we, we haven't got the, 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 the bit in the middle uh, right. But you're absolutely right. Uh, it, literacy, numeracy are going to be absolutely fundamental. And um, I, you know, personally, as we think about this COVID recovery, um, are, are quite stunned really that we, I mean, and this is, I think is just an example of the bipartisan sort of um, crisis that we have uh, in Washington. Uh, but there should be a task force on the future of education in order to be ready for this this world that was coming anyway, but COVID has now brought forward even faster. Uh, because you could you could make the case that primary, secondary, and tertiary education are not really working for that world of work now. Um, and think about in Massachusetts. Think about the new blue collar jobs that can be created out of green, clean energy and. Um, retrofitting buildings to be uh, passive buildings and energy uh, um, efficient. Think of all of those blue collar jobs and then think about where are people going to get the skills for those jobs um, and, and think about what it would take to, to, to transform that system. And then think about, you know, the amounts of money in this, in this part of the world in elite tertiary education. Um, but are we are we putting out into the world all of the skill sets that the world really needs? So I, I think there's a misalignment and, and that's the kind of challenge that, uh, that actually Massachusetts is well is well situated to 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 win that challenge. But uh, I, I don't think that's all come together quite yet. Great. Um, I, I just want to say I, I particularly love in your talking about the, the truck industry question, the perspective on change. Right, this change is inevitable. The shift from you know fighting it as long as we can, taking that compliance route to being proactive about trying to seize the future, is a challenge that is it, it's so hard for so many of us in so many different places. But it's essential for survival for success. Yeah, so thank you for that. We have a number of questions queued up from uh, Dean Cash, from my colleague, Professor Peggy Carnes, and from Maria Ivanova. So. Thanks. Thank you so much, Rachel, uh, for that great talk. Um, you've talked some about like the importance of transdisciplinarity, the importance of um, the role that research can play in, as kind of being, so, the importance of it being solutions oriented and things like that. 
So you and I are both um, in university settings where the incentives for faculty and for promotion and advancement are not necessarily aligned with those kinds of goals. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering how you think about that. And if, if you think change is necessary to create the kind of leaders that are coming out of academia to address these complex interdisciplinary um, intertwined problems. And then how would we do that? Or is, so or is trucking, is truck yeah. manufacturing easier? No, so I think that I think change is necessary. Uh, I think it's coming. Um, and you know, and I think it's coming from different directions. I mean, first of all, students are pretty, or young people are pretty clear about the fact that they want to be able to see a future. And therefore, they're going to want to have the skills that will get them the, get the, get them the income that they, that, they, that they need, right? And so I think they will keep pushing, and you see that in, in tertiary education. They're going to keep pushing for, for the skills that they need. And I think that good, um, good uh, centers of learning need to be able to provide them with those skills, but also to provide them with the know-how and then provide them with um, the rationale for why they need pure knowledge as well, right? Because you know we, we don't want we don't want to go too far the other way. So it's this it's this and you know the things I'm struggling with at Fletcher and at Tufts are you know to get the balance right between knowledge and know-how, and then package that in a way that you can actually use that in the world, and package it in a way that you can actually get a job, right? Um, so I think that's happening. I think that. Uh, I think the other thing that's that's happening is, I was very inspired by in, in Europe. There's a number of, uh, of universities now that are teaching every course is te taught by a hard scientist and a social scientist or or, or, or uh, somebody from the humanities. And so, let's say you were going to do biology, you would be taught by an ethicist and by a you know um, uh, you know a biologist biologist of some kind. And, and I, I, I'm not saying that that's what everybody should do, but I'm saying it's an interesting world, you know, view, snapshot into the kinds of problem sets that we face as humanity. So we, we're going to need more ethicists, right, in, in, in medicine and ethicists in, in, in all kinds, in, well, in the whole world of um, cyber um, uh, 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 machine learning and, and, and AI, for example. So I, th I think we have to, we can't just sort of all go off and, and sort of just work on the skills. We have to work on everything else. I, I have to say that um, I, I do think, I, I think the one thing that will have to change is sort of the business model. And uh, I'm, I'm a rookie dean, right? I've only been dean for a year. Um, but, I, you know, I, I, I think that um, uh, that it has to be tied into uh, the existential and, and non-existential challenges that humanity faces. Uh, and therefore, um, there should be, you know, real conversations around um, how many people are we educating? You know, how well are we educating them? Um, how do we therefore pay for the research and the learning that expands the boundaries of what is possible you know, and, and how do those two things complement each other and exist within the same institution? Um, uh, what is good about tenure? What isn't good about tenure in terms of responsiveness and uh, problem solving, uh, real problems? Uh, and then, you know, I think, and then I think there's a public policy role for this. So, you know, let me just take energy, which is where I perhaps spend most of my time thinking. So let's say that, the, you know, let's say we actually get the offshore wind industry that we need and want. You know, let's say that we can actually attract the 10 Asian and European companies into Massachusetts in a major way, not that they've just got their finger into, they've just put their toe into the pond at the moment, right? Let's say that they come all the way in. Let's say that we therefore know that we've got to build the talent pool for them to be able to come in and provide jobs for the next 20 to 30 years. So in that case, you know, could you, um, you know, fiddle around with the tax structure or with the public finances in some way to have some small reallocation? I don't think it takes a lot so that uh, you are channeling in lots of young people 
out of high schools into community uh, colleges. And I'm talking about doing this at scale because I know there's the odd pilot project and that you're producing and you're telling these 10, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 firms that you're going to be able to produce a steady stream of blue collar workers for an offshore wind industry. And that some of those workers are going to turn their two degrees, two years degree into four years, either at UMass Boston or at Fletcher School, uh, at Tufts School of Engineering. And they're going to come out and then they're going to be able to take the middle management and management roles. And then some of them are going to go on and do PhDs because they're going to go and work in the research labs of these companies, et cetera. And, and just uh, and basically pay these kids to go from school into, uh, into, these, into these job streams. Why? Because for every dollar that you spend on paying them to do it, you will reap the reward of in terms of growth within the broader Massachusetts economy within five to 10 years. So David, you know how to do these things because you were on that side of the fence. But I think it, we need some bold strokes. It's not just going to happen you know, because we sort of reverse through the door. We, we've got to say, this is what the economy needs to look like. These are the growth sectors. We need to pay people to go and get educated into these sectors rather than sort of expecting people to go into debt, to get educated, to work in something which might produce growth. So I, I, I you know, so aren't we lucky we've got um, two fantastic senators perfectly capable of getting their heads wrapped around this kind of thing. And if I was Joe Biden, I would be having some kind of commission to that effect. And if, uh, and if Mr. Trump remains the president, I'd still be doing it. Thanks. Thank so I didn't really answer the question, but there you go. <laughs> no, that was great. Um, we got Peggy and then Maria. Thanks, Evan, and, and thanks, Dean Kite, for a won wonderful, wonderful presentation this afternoon. Uh, being mindful that the definition of a dean is someone who is not in control of his or her faculties, um, I'm curious, however, following what you've said most recently, uh, that that uh, what what kinds of changes are you pushing at Fletcher? Ah, well, that's an exciting question. Uh, well, first of all, I love my faculty, every one of them. Um, it's like late, late woe begone, you know. Uh, what's that? Wait, late woe begone saying uh, the children are all above average. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it, it's so for me, it's interesting uh, because it's. Uh, the only way to make change is to uh, is to bring people to to a point where they see that it's that they're individ that they they will individually benefit from a shift in the common view of things, right? Um, and so I've spent I spent a lot of well, I mean my it feels I mean I've been in the job a year. It feels very strange because on the one hand it feels like I've only been in the job for four months because that's how long it was before I started planning for COVID. Um, and, and then in some cases, I feel like I've been here for 10 years uh, because it's just, you know, time and space are, are so disrupted. Um, but what, what we've tried to do is, is look at really, really quite closely at, you know, who, who how can we um, affordably educate those who would benefit from a globalist interdisciplinary uh, approach to international affairs and um, how, how do we reach them and what do we reach them with? And so this has been a full scale sort of, you know, rolling curriculum review together with a review about the degrees that we're offering and, and the way that they're structured and offered. And of course, COVID has pushed a lot of that you know, even though we're very strained working remotely, uh, has pushed this, you know, forward even further, because now I am imagining that none of us are ever going to go back to the same as it was before. There's, there's going to be a degree of hybridness about almost everything that we do. I mean, I think it's opened people's eyes to what can be taught remotely. Um, certainly, there are certain sort of workshops and skills infusions and things like that, that I don't think we need to take back and make uh, an in-person experience um, and then you know can you can you sort of restructure the year then uh, around that I'm we're a graduate school so we're dealing with people who are having to leave the workforce in order to pursue further education 
and you know the vast majority of them will want to go back into the workforce either better placed or on the career path that they want and then as we have a small subset that will continue with their further further work in their phd program and research so we're, we're now well well into a process of designing some new programs um looking at the permanent shift in some of the programs that we had as a result of COVID and then looking really, really hard at uh, what we're teaching and how we're teaching it and to whom we're teaching it. Um, so um, watch this space. There'll be the first of a set of announcements, I think, coming out. Uh, hopefully, uh, if the faculty still uh, are enthusiastic about this, um, sort of in November, December, and then there'll be another uh, sort of... Um, set of announcements coming out in the spring um, ar around some of, of what we're offering and how we're offering it. Uh, but, you know, I, I think that, yeah, this is tough for everybody. Um, and it's a global marketplace. We, we've been competing globally for a few years. And if you're in the business of international affairs education, yeah. yeah. Um, but, but now you really are, and you're competing with Asia and Europe. I mean, why would you travel to the United States? To I mean, even if you could get into the country, why would you travel now when, when the country is so clearly not able to stay on top of the pandemic? Mm -hmm. So, you know, you've got students, you know, asking pretty profound questions about, okay, well, I would like to have that degree and that educational experience, but, you know, I'm not going to put my health and safety at risk for it. And, and then if I can't, if I have an uncertainty around getting a visa... So there's, there's, this country also needs to re-clarify to the world about uh, what it wants to offer in terms of, uh, of education being one of the things that the United States competes on. So Evan, I'll jump, I'll Thank jump you. right in here. And let me just say that I just got asked the question about where is the raise hand function? So you can either point to your own picture in the three little dots and you can raise your hand or you can open up the participant list and you'll see raise hand there. Um, so we have uh, Maria and then Jeff and then Adam Green. Thank you. I, I wanna add um, a question exactly in the same in the same vein that we've been discussing. Obviously, Rachel, you have you have joined the educators guild here, because our and our questions are about academia as as the industry and the future of it. I'm teaching the doctoral colloquium this this semester, where we do have students from around the world in the virtual room of Zoom because some of them were not able to come into, into the country. And uh, this, this semester, we've rethought the assignments and hoping at the end of the semester to come out with a vision of a new academic. What does it mean to be, to be an academic in this new era? And I would love to hear your, your version of, uh, of that vision given that we are also a graduate school at McCormick and you are working with a graduate school, you have a PhD program, we have PhD programs. Our own faculty, Darren Q, received his PhD at the Tufts School. So how do we educate at that level? What is your vision for the new academic in the new era? So it's a really good question. I haven't, I, that isn't, I haven't framed the question that way. So I, so it, I, that's, I, I should uh, go away and think about that. Um, I think that we, um, so my, my best academics, right. You know, the, the, the people to, for the people who are, people that people come to Fletcher to study with, right? Or to be around, right? Um, it's very interesting to me coming in. They, they are brilliant instructors, brilliant researchers, brilliant nurturers of new researchers, and so supervisors of PhD and postdocs or whatever. They're all three things. And, and I think that there's this sort of, hangover of a sort of very out of date uh, view that you know you, you you're either a good instructor or you're a good researcher 
or your uh, you know or your you know and then the, the nurturing of young researchers and and often gets left in the middle but i, I the, when i look at my faculty my extraordinary faculty i mean they're all wonderful right but my extraordinary faculty can do all three things and and i think that's really what it's what it's about um today from from from, from a university perspective from a school perspective and then i think we've been we've been looking very hard at um our phd program and, and also looking at uh, pursuing research short of a PhD uh, because we're, we're a professional school and uh, a lot of our a lot of people that come through our doors a lot of people who then leave want to continue to push back the boundaries of their own knowledge and their own practice etc but short of doing a PhD so I think we've been spending a lot of time in that space as well great uh, thank you Jeff Hi, Dean. Kai, thank you so much for your inspiring and informative uh, remarks today. Um, I think they're they're very compatible with the kinds of work that uh, um, this this school mm -hmm. is doing as well. Um, I I don't want to talk about academics. I want to talk about temporal politics. And what strikes me about climate change about a lot of the environmental challenges that we face is it's not only a question of what kinds of policies and outcomes can we achieve but also about how quickly can we achieve them um, given you know yeah. we don't really know where that kind of ecological threshold is where the best intervention in the world will be too late um, and it it alarms me some that in this country one entire party is not only not interested in sort of he head on addressing this this problem, but also aggressively hostile towards policies that would, um, you know, result in, in better environmental stewardship. But even within the other party, and, you know, you've mentioned several times uh, Joe Biden's slogan of build back better. You wove that throughout your remarks. Uh, what happens if that's not good enough, building back better to some point where we were? as opposed to a sort of transformational change to, to address problems that are unprecedented. How can we, um, even if this election results in a Biden administration, what kinds of academic policy and advocacy initiatives would, would be needed to push beyond incremental change to something that uh, would be on the scale of the kind of intervention needed to address this scope of problem in the, you know, in, in all the environmental problems that we're facing, but particularly on climate change. So this is two, this is almost two, well, there's lots of questions in there, but let me take a shot at two of them, right? First of all, is around tipping points. And I think that we're, you know, we're we're we're, at, we're over planetary boundaries. We're up against the planetary boundaries, and we're seeing tipping. We're seeing ourselves dangerously entering into or past tipping points in terms of uh, environmental destruction, impacts of climate change, etc. All eyes on the poles, the two are uh, the Arctic and the Antarctic, because uh, we're, we're dangerous. Within the next ten years, we're dangerously close at doing something that's irreversible there. And then we 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 also see. Uh, the crossing tipping points in the way in which uh, fires uh, are, are dominating certain parts of the world, etc. So, but on the, there's also the tipping points of you know when you start getting to you know 110 trillion dollars you know now uh, under uh, transparency disclosures for climate risk, uh, you are now uh, well into the territory of being mainstream. That's not peripheral. Uh, you are now seeing um, all major insurers, the 30 biggest asset owners in the world, comfortable that climate is a macro critical risk. The IMF is now fully integrating climate as macro critical into its macro critical assessment reports, Article 4, but also into their FSAPs, which are their health checks that they do on the banking and financial system for every country. So we, and this is going at warp speed. And I was talking to the head of HSBC two weeks ago and he said, Rachel, you know, are we at warp speed three or four, right? So he thinks it's going fast as well. 
not just me sitting, you know, at my home in Lexington. Um, I think the other thing to say about tipping points is actually something that happened that week of the General Assembly. So, you know, you had the EU uh, announced just before the General Assembly started uh, that they were going to, um, you know, enter this race to zero and be um, uh, 55% reduction, you know, by 2030, et cetera, you, and be carbon neutral by mid-century. You saw the Chinese come out and make an announcement that was not expected uh, uh, around their neutrality by 2060. And suddenly you have two of the three biggest emitters in the world saying, we're now in a race and we're going to win it. Uh, and the race is about decarbonizing. And the, you suddenly saw all kinds of switchboard lights flashing on, Democrat and Republican alike in this country, because this, this notion, and this was the reason why the Trump administration pulled out of Paris, this notion that this is going to cost us jobs, it's going to cost us growth, it's going to be punitive to the American people and the American public, it's going to be bad for the American farmer and everything like that, is completely turned on its head because now it's like, oh gosh, they're, all, they're racing, they, they've left the starting blocks, shouldn't we be in that race and shouldn't we be in it to win it? And you know, I was fielding calls because that was the week that we testified in Congress. We were fielding calls from, from, from congressmen and women, Republican, Democrat, about like, wait a minute, is, the, is this, we should be in this race, right? And, and, we, and so it got, it, you know, even people who had been like, oh, climate change is a bad thing. It was like, okay, maybe there's a good thing here if we could be in a race to decarbonize and win. It's going to be good for Americans. It's going to be good to, for trade, etc. I mean, the other thing is just trade alone. I mean, you know, if everybody else in the world decides that carbon is a bad and that therefore it's going to be, you know, penalized in, in board, uh, border tax adjustments and trade in trade policy, then if you're the United States, you, you need to be able to cope with that, whether you agree or not agree, right? You, you're going to be a taker if you're outside of the race. So I think that those are important things. I, and I think that if you had a change, you know, honestly, I think that uh, there are other changes short of, uh, a different president, which which might bring forward some of the, these tipping points. And then on the Build Back Better, well, you know, that was, uh, Antonio Guterres said that before Biden did. So I've sort of had it in my head uh, then. And I think it was also part of Ursula von Leyen's speeches as well in the spring. So I'm glad that everybody wants to build back better. Um, I wasn't sort of touting for Biden particularly by, by saying it. But I, I do think that there is now at the international level of economic cooperation at the G20, G7, um, uh, between the UN and the IMF, a, a convergence around the idea that there's only one recovery. We're not recovering from COVID and then trying to have a, you know, a climate uh, set of deals uh, that, that that is all one thing and what's been very impressive is the violent agreement amongst economists about the fact that there are policy measures which get you short-term medium-term and long-term action which is all aligned so uh, in the IEA IMF report that came out in June around a sustainable recovery they identified refurbishment of the built environment you could start with commercial real estate and then move on to residential real estate uh, and that that provides you with short-term jobs, um, semi-skilled, skilled. It provides you with income uh, boost, and it provides you with a pathway to net zero. Um, building out the infrastructure for electric vehicles, and this is charging stations and things like this, provides you with good quality, semi-skilled, skilled jobs in the local environment, uh, provides you with growth, and provides you with a trajectory towards net zero. And they sort of parcel it out into like 30 to 40 policy measures, which are going to be necessary for the transition, but are also necessary for getting communities back to work. Um, and these are all possible to do. They, they are not impossible to do. Um, so, Thank you. Adam? What do you think of the um, corporation-developed certification programs like Google's certificate for AI or, or other uh, topics um, to achieve some of these goals, either uh, as an alternative to, to um, university or, or built into university in some hybrid way or supplementing, um, how, how can that work for us? Yeah, I think those kinds of certificates, I mean, I think that they, you know, they, they could become embedded right in the, in universities or, or, or outside, and you, you're starting to see, 
you know, I mean, I think it's uh, so. Yes, I I, th I think that this is definitely part of a dynamic. Um, I you know, I, I am interested in this sort of you know, you're defined by who you educate, not by who you don't educate, right? So this is sort of ASU versus Harvard, um, and and I think that the but managing the public private managing the the the, the sort of uh, ethics and conflicts issues around the private sector's engagement. So, you know, you need to have a sort of guaranteed platform and then, you know, there's a sort of private sector widget on top. I'm not sure that you want to go to Google University, as it were, although maybe I might be completely wrong about that. But I, I do think that Google's universities partnering with Google and the like around a defined sort of global commons problem uh, it is it is it is happening more and more and more and the one that i know the most recent one that i know the most about is google using its uh capabilities together with a number of other partners to be able to give you in real time on a dashboard a picture of exactly who is emitting what from where and if you think about that and then think about the way the UN does it at the moment, where every country submits a report, normally six months over, over deadline, sometimes never. And then the UN takes a year to compile the report. And then you have a sort of very hard to read, difficult assessment of what you know, emissions are versus in real time pressing a button saying, okay, that smokestack over there in, um, you know, Jakarta is emitting this amount of um, CO2 and this amount of methane. Uh, oh, and this one over here in uh, in uh, you know in North Dakota is is doing the same. I, that that's profoundly revolutionising and brings up all kinds of issues of global governance, which I'm sure Professor Ivanova will sort out for us. Which is that the the IP for that is owned in in California. The money to make it happen is coming from California. New York and Colorado. The governance around that is is just the people who happen to be involved in the in the in the thing, and there's absolutely no international governance or oversight around that. And it starts mattering when financial flows to assist you in your development will be based upon data which is publicly available to everybody, but which is privately held. And suddenly, you know, Indonesia's next. Uh, a tranche of money from the Asia Development Bank or something is is constrained because this website over here shows you that they haven't actually curtailed their emissions. So then you're, you're going to get into really interesting territory about who's that. Now, is Google prepared to make that, you know, available and maybe owned by the UN in the same way that sort of George Clooney's um, satellite tracking um of human rights abuses was I, I I don't know but these are the kinds these are the reasons why we need the ethicists and the scientists all sitting together in universities uh, as well as uh, in private corporations. Thank you. So um, Maria was going to introduce the one question from the chat and then I think we'll uh, wrap up. And uh, the last question uh, Rachel if builds off of, of this last answer that you gave, but what are some of the ongoing or planned initiatives to focus on recruiting more female students into global governance, diplomacy, law, human security, but also to entice them to continue contributing to academia? This is from William Wyman. How do we get more women in the room where it happens? So it's interesting, you know, I, we don't have any problem to uh, attract really good women into Fletcher. Um, and I've, I've sort of talked to our alumni office anything about tracking what happens to them afterwards so that we understand where the disruption starts, right? So I, I, I'm, I'm aware of fairly good data, for example, for international lawyers in the UK about what happens to women, what happens to men at the point of graduation if they're interested in international law and things like that. So we, 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 have, to, we have to understand uh, uh, what happens there. But I think that, you know, it's the, these institutions, you, you hire in your own image, right? Uh, that, that's what happens. 
And so um, hiring decisions in a lot of the international organizations, although some of them have gone great strides towards it, um, uh, you know, are, are still the networks where you know that the job is available, you know, the network, it, it's, it, those networks are, um, you know, still very male oriented and still very white, right? So one of the, 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 the more profound conversations I've had over the last three to four months is, is with our, uh, you know, black, indigenous, uh, people of color, alumni and uh, students about the fact that they come to Fletcher without the networks that other students have and other students may take for granted and faculty may take for granted. And how do you replicate or, or, or take that um, omission uh, away as a, 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 and not make that uh, something which is going to trip them up uh, in their career? And I've talked to, I talked to, um, had a, s a series of meetings with um, uh, black women, uh, recent alums. So they, these are women who've graduated in the last five, six, seven years, um, who are all doing fantastic jobs and doing really well. But all of the, almost all of them told me that these weren't the jobs that they planned for. Those jobs were really just closed off to them. And so they, they had to pivot and go around the houses in order to get onto the career path they wanted. And that they, they were not at all sure that that's what they would have had to do if they were white women. And they're not at all sure that that's what they would have had to do if they were white men. And so I think there's layer upon layer upon layer of this, but I, I am really, um, uh, it is reinforced to me regularly how close these networks and these sort of, uh, you know, boys clubs or even women's clubs, white women's clubs now uh, are to, to others. And that is something that these institutions have to constantly work with. And then we have to use our networks to help uh, our students sort of vault into those places, um, overcoming whatever disadvantage they think they might have. So I, I think it's going to be long and it's a long and hard struggle. But I, I also then just think about my own, um, you know, my colleagues and my friends and, and the sisterhood that works on issues of sustainability and climate and um yeah, there isn't a day goes by, by when you don't sort of like have to roll your eyes at something. But, uh, you know, if you help each other, um, then you can make a difference in a measurable amount of time. Thank you. So I should say that I am being lobbied privately in the chat, both to end and, um, and respect people's time and also to keep things open because more people have questions. Um, so I'm, I'm going to fail either way. Um, but I do want to, what I'm going to do is I want to say a couple of thank yous. And if um, Dean Kite, if you, if you want to hang around for another couple of minutes, and if other people do, maybe we can, can let it dribble on for a, a little bit as we normally might at the front of the room after the, after the talk ends. Um, I do want to thank, um, I want to thank uh, Dean Cash for joining us and offering his thoughts at the beginning. I think it looks like he might be, he might be gone already. Um, once again, Ben Slomoff, um, the Slomoff family, Adam Green and B Brian Green, his grandsons are here, and Nancy Sonnebend, a friend of the Slomoff family, um, who have been so supportive of all this, and it's great to have you here. Ben, it's so good to see you at one of these events again. Really terrific. Um, I want to thank uh, the folks in our department who pull off these events uh, year after year and multiple times a year. and you sort of think it's going to be easier and less work once we're uh, COVIDized and stuck at home, and at least you don't have to arrange for catering, but turns out it's still a ton of work. So Kelly Ward Mason and Lee Murphy and Charlotte Namby do incredible work to make these things fly. Thank you all so much for that. Uh, Thanks to all my colleagues and all the students uh, for showing up here. And thank you, Dean Kite, for really a tremendous, tremendous afternoon. It was really, we all learned a tremendous amount. So thank you all. <laughs>